Well, Bob, thank you for that introduction. Some introduction. <laughs> so firstly, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Tim Andrews of the Australian Taxpayers Alliance to have taken the steps to engage with the HR Nickel Society and organise this event. Of this event to recognise our wonderful friend, colleague and champion of freedom, Ray Evans. It's a privilege to be part of this celebration. When I look around the room, I see a sea of admiring faces, all of whom have in their separate ways been touched by Ray's presence during his 74 years with us. A special acknowledgement, of course, to Jill, a wonderful Jill, who in addition to being a wife and mother, was a tireless supporter of Ray in every aspect of his life. So I'd have to say, if Ray were here, he would again acknowledge this, and in his absence, we do it for him. Ray's family are here again, and we're delighted it is so. As they say in diplomatic circles, Ray has no better friend than Bob. <laughs> It's really great to see Bob with us this evening, and again, we have to conduct a well-choreographed uh, twosome as we have th had the privilege to do so on previous occasions. 2010 at the testimonial dinner, and 2014, it was Ray's funeral. In his introduction, Bob relates how he first became aware and then engaged with Ray, and I think on this occasion, I will take his lead and do likewise. To do so requires some personal background. As a first year law student towards the end of my first year, I was offered what was thought to be a short and temporary appointment as a judge's associate in the Commonwealth Industrial Court. But subsequently, the appointment lasted for four years. Coming from a cloistered private school background, I recall well feeling the ills of the world could easily be solved if only people would talk to each other. Well, my exposure to the court's practice constituted a wake-up call of some moment. I recall vividly an awakening to the real world when BHP had sought an injunction, then known as a Section 109, against the Siemens Union on the basis it had prevented the provision of seamen to man the ships now short of staff at Port Kembla. The union appeared and responded indignantly to the, fact, uh, to the effect that the shortage was the outcome of the mean low pay offered by BHP. Now, the application for the injunction was accordingly dismissed. However, some time later, BHP sought to reopen the request. It advised the court it had responded to the Seaman Union explanation by advertising for staff, and many came forward in response. Having selected new staff, it was required that they should all become members of the union. No ticket, no job. At this point, BHP introduced into the court several of those who had presented themselves to the union office for a membership ticket. One had his arm in a sling, the other was had a heavily bandaged head. Now, I'm not sure if this constituted a sort of Damascan conversion, but it really had a lasting influence. That, and to this day, I will never forget the court scene. So fast forward now to the 1970s. I became chairman of the Australian Mining Industry Council, and in that position was thrust into the public arena for the first time. The Hawke Economic Summit had its moments when, encouraged by David Project, uh, to Trebek to have a go, I took a tangential approach to the accord from that for the rest of the business community. However, my limitations soon came home when responding to an invitation from Gerard Henderson to address the Sydney Institute. I recognised I'd made a real hash of the occasion, for the audience had not the slightest idea of what I was talking about, and on reflection, for good reason. Back in the office, I asked myself, what do I do? As if an answer to a prayer, it was Ray who came to the rescue. As he related in a farewell address to colleagues at WMC in August 1981, he wrote to Avi Pabo requiring if he could obtain a job with WMC. Not long afterwards, he was attending a seminar in Sydney organised by Greg Lindsay 
and of the CIS, and he found me in attendance, as I was a trustee, and required if I knew of his approach to Arvey. Yes, I replied, and produced Ray's letter from my jacket pocket. <laughs> Thus started a great friendship and working relationship until Ray left us. So, what of Ray's job? As, and again, as Ray described it later, I've been a soldier in the culture wars. What are the culture wars and why are the mining industry involved? Mining is traditionally associated with brawn rather than brains. Thick heads and broad shoulders, to quote Robert Haupt, end quote. He was described in the Australian as, quote, Morgan's link man, employed, as he described it, with his role to engage in the culture wars and provide him with feedback. And that's as it happened, and so lasted, and those started a 30-year, 33-year friendship. It was not all plain sailing. There were periods of drama, challenge, and within both the company and shareholders, not all were on side with the path chosen when tackling a range of matters of public interest. I must acknowledge it was, it was with uh, quiet but essential support from Avi Pabo as chairman of the company to see through some challenging times, both personal and corporately. Avi also engaged in public debate effectively. It was in 1992, Paul Keating was facing an election and Ford, under the leadership of Jack Nasser, decided to take on the proposed easing of uh, import tariffs. The coalition was attacked day in and day out by direct advertising in an effective and aggressive campaign. Again, as recalled by Ray, and I quote, after discussion with Hugh and Saravi, we went on a campaign to steady the troops. Hugh gave a speech in Perth attacking Ford, defending the tariff phase out and threatening Ford that Western mining would never buy a Ford or four wheel drive again. That speech got quite a good run, but it was not the killer blow. And Ray goes on. It was Arvey who delivered the killer blow. With superb sense of timing, Arvey wrote a 300 word letter to every newspaper in the country, pointing out what the basic issues in the debate were and defending both the government and the opposition for sticking to a policy which was now beginning to deliver great benefits. When the letter appeared all over Australia, journalists by the score tried to find a single business leader who would criticise Arvey for what he had said. They could not find one. And that was the end of the debate." End quote. I've related these events as background to Ray's remarkable contribution to what he calls the culture wars, and as others refer to them as the battle for ideas. Bob has listed the main entities, the, the Samuel Griffith Society, the Galatians Group, the Lavoisier Group, the Benlong Society, and last, and not the least, our host for this evening, the H.R. Nichols Society, of which more later. I would also add the Australian Lecture Foundation with its committee consisting of Heinz Arndt, Peter Derham, David Kemp, John Urig, uh, John Newtz, and John Valder and it proved as an entity which were used uh, to issue invitations, a source to invite the speakers, mainly from overseas, to come and be available to present with other like-minded uh, organizations. So now to the HR Nichols Society. As Bob correctly records, it was the issue of industrial relations that Ray saw as the greatest policy challenge of all. We start from the oft-quoted Adam Smith lines, which he used often. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard for their own interests. Ray loved delving into the wealth of nations to find the text supporting fundamental values of freedom. The freedom to trade one's services, protection of the law of contract and property rights, and the freedom of speech. They go to the basic needs of a successful society to provide an economic, uh, an engine of economic performance, and in Smith's words, benevolence. 
When Ray joined Western Mining, our national tradition in matters of labor, pra labor practice, law, and expectation was of the British social expectation embodied in the work of Henry Bournes Higgins, the author of the provision in our Constitution giving the Commonwealth power with respect to conciliation and arbitration. And it's from this power we have inherited the Commonwealth Arbitration Court, of which Henry Bournes Higgins was the president. By 1911, the editor of HR, the editor H.R. Nichols, at the age of 82, of the Mercury, a modest Hobart newspaper, initiated a heated exchange of criticism of the Chief Justice and was sued for contempt. The case was dismissed in the High Court and H.R. Nichols became a hero in Hobart. Ray described Higgins as a nut but came to respect his confidence and energy. This confidence, Ray records, as being in contrast with the indecision and confusion with which so many of our contemporary leaders approach this pivotal issue in Australian life. But I need to backtrack. In the several years before HRN came into being, several industrial confrontations gave the spark to generate a response which has, as Peter Costello remarks in his record of the dollar sweets uh, affair, in a very readable account one can find in Google, became, quote, a part of Australian industrial folklore. One of the nicest people to meet, Fred Stouter, the owner of a family, family sweet factory, but whom suffered at the hands of an ambitious unionist ideologue, gave rise to a remarkable confrontation in industrial thuggery and which with the combination and support of Fred, for Fred, led to a resounding success of justice. Peter played a key role in this and being here tonight, well, if you wanted to, I'd be very happy if he came up and gave an account of how important that was. <laughs> Likewise, we've had the famous Mudgeonberry dispute in the Northern Territory, the lead to overcome a, a, similar, a similar unreasonableness as suffered by Dollar Sweets led by Ian McLaughlin of the NFF, the stupidity of the determination of what was then the Arbitration Commission was finally challenged in the court. And as Paul Hooligan re recounts, what, I'm sorry, what Hooligan's, Hooligan. <laughs> all part of the script, it's all part of the script. And he said, what Marchenberry has shown is that where an employer believes in what he's doing, the law as it stands now is there to enable him to protect himself and his employees against rapacious action of unions who have forgotten the purpose for which they've been poured into being. But the mother of all disputes was Roe River. The challenge that Charles Copeland undertook in particular throughout 1986 is well recorded. HRN has a ball by ball description of events uh, at this inaugural meeting on the 23rd of February, 1986, just as the Robe River drama started to uh, really unfold. It continued to escalate until the following year. Charles recorded the events in a later paper to the society. What is missing from that paper is the overall trend in industrial disputes in the country at that time. He recorded that these with these in great care. In 1981, 722 major disputes, with a gradual decline until 1985, but just under 600, just before Robe River dispute hit the headlines. Ten years later, it was down to 100. He records the decrease of the, to the explanation given by Peter Costello of the rapid increase in common law actions being the consequence of the Dollar Sweets case. And I quote, inspired the effort to put an end to the industrial anarchy at Robe River. The achievements of Charles we celebrate with the annual award, but for Charles, it was a Pyrrhic victory. During 1988, Pico merged with North Broken Hill. As CEO of Pico, Charles was excluded from the negotiations following the conclusion of which Charles was dismissed. It was a political execution, 
with particular members of the board being close to the Labour Party, and Charles records the likely role of Bob Hawke, with whom there was an apparent resentment going back to the days when they were both at Oxford. <laughs> Charles attended the first meeting of the HR and Society at the CWA Centre in Lancel Road on the 28th of February 1986. He felt at home in the, in the pres uh, as the presentations, one after another, followed a familiar theme of union bullying and contempt for the rule of law. But it was not that unruly behaviour providing the ultimate stimulation to the HR Society creation, but very much that of two other events. And the first was Jared Henderson's seminal essay on the 31st of August 1983 in an edition of Quadrant exposing the Industrial Relations Club. Others may claim the branding name of the IRC, but it was Gerard who enabled it to take on the uh, approbation of Scorn, and he was present at the CWA to see it engraved into the lexicon of the general literature describing the operations of the relations at that industrial relations at that time. And the second reason, so well distilled for me, to me by Ray in the preparation of a paper given at that meeting was of the Hancock Report, and in particular, the two seminal sentences. Trade unions are, says Hancock, to varying degrees, centres of power. They replace the powerlessness of individual workers with collective strength. And it's a mistaken view of the plural society to assume that every subject is equal, equally dominated by the might of the state in its arms of enforcement. Now together, these two sentences were an attack on the sovereignty of the state. So there we have it. Ray and John Stone, Barry Purvis and Peter Costello signed the formation papers for the HRN Society. That first meeting became a cause celeb when the renowned journalist Pamela Williams, in the December edition of the Business Weekly Review, of 1986 wrote of the attendance with a headline screaming, Liberal's secret plan to crack union power. Given the CWA meeting was open to the press with all papers published, it did seem remarkable to pretend there was anything secret, but not far from the mark in its intent to diminish union power. It was even more remarkable when on the earlier on March the 18th edition of the Bulletin, Alan Malt reviewed the meeting under the heading Rise of Deregulation Tempo and our Tim Duncan's article under the heading Waving a Mischievous Kerr Flag did their best to warn what was coming. As to the naming of the society, Peter Costello recalls, we are, we are named in honour of a man should be lionised because he showed contempt for the commission. Whilst others... Uh, than those that signed the memorandum established the society played a part in that inspiration of Ray, of whom I give special credit for this uh, institution having been ceded to our common good. Ray had three bronze busts of H.R. Nichols made, one of which I presume is still with Jill, one with John Stone, and one's on my desk. Now, uh, well... It might be a prize one day, John. <laughs> no, 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 Peter. We travelled the world together in particular, attending the International Committee for Mining and Environment, whether it was in its headquarters in Ottawa or as many meetings in London or Europe. A, a great book could be dedicated to Ray's wonderful contribution to our well-being. We had planned to publish the combined works of the papers he prepared for me. Some 150 papers and lectures were the tangible output of our relationship. Hours of debate and discussion, much, much to lessen, I must say, the vibrant tone of Ray's first drafts, <laughs> were in retrospect precious moments in my life. As he reported to the Australian in 2003, quote, he is no longer paid by Morgan, but they are old mates and talk to each other constantly. Ray was noticed by his outrageous laugh, his questioning of public presenters less knowledgeable than they ought to have been of the subject of which the question came as a terrifying inquisitional thrust. 
His exuberant energy, his knowledge in each of the areas noted by Bob, in which he played the lead role in establishing a portfolio of entities to conduct the cultural wars and the depth of knowledge he brought to the debate. He loved the debate and was totally fearless in its conduct. For me, I could not have had a better companion at work, a friend at large, and a tutor at hand. As he remarked to a reporter, quote, when I joined WMC, it was the start of a 20-year seminar. <laughs> Fortunately, I and Bob and many others here tonight were all part of Ray's seminar audience for more than 30 years. Ray was always restless to do something. At home, he was bu always building or engaged in a repair project. He blamed Jill. She wants X or Y done. <laughs> but we all knew it was a task when completed, he would show with pride. No plumber, no electrician, no carpenter was needed. It was the talented Ray to contemplate the task at hand. It's as if he needed to use and show his capabilities. I asked, Tom this morning, what struck him most about Ray, and he noted perceptively Ray's frustration when his heart issues induced an increased stress in his life in the knowledge he would be limited in what he could physically undertake. Marysville was, and the fire that destroyed the cottage did give him a challenge to rebuild to extend his friendship with the local tradespeople, whom he immediately established firm friendships, and the battle royal with local authorities about the house design. <laughs> it's a great house. Marysville shed, some shed. So carefully constructed, unlike all buildings in the immediate vicinity, was not consumed by the fire, engulfing all that was before it. He proudly showed the melted pipes inside the shed to demonstrate the temperatures it had resisted. <laughs> so it comes as no surprise, the interim house warming was held in Ray's shed. And I can give you the YouTube site at which these celebrations are well recorded. <laughs> so to Ray, we pay homage. To Jill, we extend our love. Thank you. <laughs>